On a dark, dimly lit street sat two cars. A woman stood beside one. She was waiting for something, as she'd been instructed weeks before. Moments of silence turned to minutes of anticipation. A short while later, a man emerged from the second vehicle. He closed the door with the usual force and began walking towards her. As he entered the beam of headlights, a suitcase was noticeable in one hand. The woman shuddered. She knew what was coming next. She'd been here before on an almost identical night, one too many times. The man came to a halt at the hood of the vehicle beside her, opening the suitcase. Inside were what he called his tools. A razor, a box cutter, sandpaper, a thick glass liquor bottle, a brick, a frying pan, a plastic bottle with a funnel, Red Bull, aspirin, and a neck brace. Ready, he said to the visibly shaken woman. She took the plastic bottle, the funnel, and she climbed into the back seat, emerging a few minutes later. As she did, the man was stood waiting with a box cutter as if he was about to open an Amazon delivery. Only, it was the woman's face he was about to open. A few seconds later, he pulled the woman's hand from the wound to inspect his handiwork. You don't bleed well, he said, sounding incredibly frustrated. He then grabbed the sandpaper and began to scratch at her face, trying to keep his calm as she yelled out in pain. The next step, well, that required the liquor bottle. Stand still, he said, as he raised the bottle into the air and behind his back. Seconds later, the woman was on the floor. He picked her up, put her in the driver's seat, affixed a neck brace, fastened the seatbelt, and closed the door. He rushed the tools back into the suitcase and walked back to his car. This is where he sped towards a vehicle at 40 miles per hour, making sure to hit at just the right angle to send the vehicle spinning upon impact. He then rushed over to the barely conscious and confused woman, grabbed the neck brace, the empty bottle of urine, and rushed to his nearby getaway vehicle. Just another day in the life of William Mize IV. This is his story. The attention to detail Bill put into his staged accidents make Ocean Eleven look like child's play. He averaged about six of them a year. He himself was almost never involved in the actual crash when people arrived, because that would be too suspicious. Who gets in that many accidents? What he did instead was arrange with co-conspirators to buy luxury used cars, get insurance coverage with high limits, something like $100,000 payout per person and $300,000 per accident, and then arrange everything behind the scenes. He would designate one car as the victim car, with the other being the at-fault car. The driver of the at-fault car would have a pre-rehearsed story, like they reached down to grab a CD, took their eyes off the road for just a moment, and that's when, bang, the impact happened. Bill assigned his friends and family members roles to play as if they were actors in a drama, having them memorise their fake identities and stories about what they were doing when the accident occurred. While some things changed, there were always a few constants. Accidents involving a vehicle were always at night, and always at previously determined locations where they had no cameras. Nothing was left up to chance, everything was planned to the very minute, to the very injury. To be successful in this business, it needed to be. That means superficial injuries or a lack of commitment could not be tolerated, not by Godfather Bill. Everything had to be real, so no one could know it was fake. This means pain. Bill would use a razor or a box cutter to create eyebrow gashes. He'd use a liquor bottle or a frying pan to bust someone's knee or their head. After years of trial and error, he found that wounds looked more realistic if he wrapped a brick in sandpaper and hit them with it. Concussions, they were great for business. Insurance companies loved concussions. They'd pay out big time for those. He'd also splatter blood all over the car windows to make it look as if a passenger had hit their head. He'd read online that people who were knocked unconscious during collisions were likely to urinate themselves. So of course, his co-conspirators urinated in bottles and poured it on themselves before first responders arrived. Bill was never actually at the scene when anyone arrived, he would just drive the at-fault car and then run away. The reason for this was that he had it down to a science. He knew exactly where to hit to do the most damage to the car, making it look as bad as possible without hurting the people inside. Well, hurting them more, of course. After the impact, he fled the scene, while one of his other cronies took his place at the wheel. Emergency services were always involved, wasting their precious time treating the victims of Bill's scheme, Time that would likely have been needed elsewhere for real accidents. At the hospital, actors from the victim car would say they had insurance, but they didn't have their information on hand. Weeks later, they'd ask for an itemised bill and pay for whatever treatment they received in cash, at of course a discount rate. 
This was all part of the plan. Bill would then assume one of his fake identities, acting as the victim's representative or their power of attorney, and he'd negotiate a settlement with the at-fault insurance company, playing the good guy, saving them from a potential big money lawsuit. Being an expert at this, not only would he fleece them out of what the hospital had charged, he'd even change the itemised bill to show higher medical costs, sometimes adding claims of lost income and property damage. The insurance company paid out every single time. The only question was, how much? The lowest expected was $100,000, and the record was just over $300,000. Bill, of course, being the mastermind, took the lion's share of the money. He would divvy up the rest between the co-conspirators based on their participation. That is, after he deducted expenses. Travel, meals, office supplies like printer ink. I mean, this was a real business after all, and he had operational costs to cover. Considering the numbers here, you might be asking yourself, why would anyone sign up for this? Surely there's got to be a better way to earn $10,000 than having an old man beat you with a liquor bottle or bash your head in with a frying pan. Well, that's where Bill's manipulation comes into play. You didn't really have a choice but to participate when he was done with you. Ah, family. The people you're supposed to cherish, protect and trust, right? Not for Bill Mize. To him, family was a source of income, a supply of warm bodies to bloody for the sake of insurance payouts. There's a reason why he was called the godfather of white collar crime. It's because he relied on family members and friends to conduct his deranged business. When it came to staging accidents, Bill needed to make sure he was working with people he could rely upon, people he knew he could trust. One set of loose lips could sink Bill's multi-million dollar yacht. Due to this, all of the major employees of Insurance Fraud R Us were close family members, starting with his wife, Sandy Talento, who ironically had a degree in criminal justice and trained as a reserve cop. Next up was his son and namesake, William Mize V, his daughter Angela, and his cousin's son, Ryan Folks Park. Of the four stars in Bill's little show, three of them made complete sense, his wife and two kids. Ryan, however, was distant enough of a relation that he might have been a concern. Bill was a master at negotiating such concerns. Ryan grew up in San Francisco, but when his parents separated, Bill encouraged Ryan's mom to move down to Acapulco, where Bill was living at the time, running a small business commonly referred to as the sale of drugs. Ryan idolised Uncle Bill as he liked to call him. To Ryan, he was tan, in shape, well off, he had all the good things going for him. By the time Ryan was in his 20s, he was living in Las Vegas and trying to make ends meet by working at an architecture firm. This, however, wasn't part of Bill's plan. He was already staging accidents by this point, and having a limited number of actors was risky. This is when Bill planted a seed in Ryan and waited for it to grow. How do you make sure someone will help you? Well, you help them first. If they feel indebted to you, that you've done them a kindness while expecting nothing in return, they're more likely to feel obligated to do so. Bill had enough experience manipulating people to know how to use this in a nefarious manner. When it came to Ryan, he knew his plan to move to Las Vegas, and he didn't want him so far away. Instead of trying to prevent it happening, he insisted on helping with a $15,000 loan towards a house down payment. This was a loan, not a gift. Luckily for Bill, the financial crisis of 2007 happened, leaving Ryan without a way to repay said loan and defaulting on the mortgage. What will we do? You know, how can Ryan ever repay Uncle Bill now? I have an idea, said Bill. Words that you never wanted to hear if you really knew this man. The idea was to have a ceiling fan fall on Bill's wife Sandy while they were visiting Ryan's house. I can only imagine my own face if my uncle or anyone suggested this to me. Ryan, however, was indebted to Uncle Bill. He wanted to pay him back, he wanted to pay back that kindness, and so that's what they planned. The day of the scam, Sandy and Bill walked into Ryan's guest bedroom. Wait outside, Bill said. A few minutes passed by, followed by a few more, followed by a massive crash. Ryan, despite knowing what was going on, rushed in to see if the plan had gone wrong. Was somebody hurt? And what he saw was almost like that of a Tarantino movie. Uncle Bill was standing over two things. The first being the fan he'd ripped out of the ceiling, and the second being his wife, who he'd slashed with a box cutter and then beat with a metal pan. There was nothing fake about this accident. Sandy was really hurt, and that's exactly why it always worked. After Bill collected a check from the insurance company for Sandy's injuries, he told Ryan his debt had been paid. Easy as that. Ryan was free and clear. 
Yeah, right. Bill's plan had worked to perfection. Shortly after this, Ryan fell in love with a bartender from Washington named Kimberly Boito. She and her daughter moved into the house with Ryan. At this point, Bill, pretending to care, seized the perfect opportunity to lock Ryan down long term. He paid off the mortgage to the house in full, putting his name on the deed. He owned the house that Ryan and his new family were living in. They agreed to pay him $225,000 over the next three years, with 6% interest. And how exactly would they afford to do this? Well, Bill, of course, had a plan for that too. It just so happens he knew where the pair could earn enough money to settle their debt to him. Flash forward to Uncle Bill beating the shit out of Ryan's girlfriend with his suitcase of bricks, knives, bottles, and sandpaper. Bill employed a similar tactic with his daughter, Angela. At first, Angela did whatever she could to avoid her father's shady dealings. She knew exactly where the money was coming from. She'd seen what he had done to her mother. The weeks of damage done to her face, the multiple concussions. She'd seen what her dad put her brother Will through. And though she was jealous of the money he made, she also saw the downsides. Like the time he had to be stitched up after Bill cut a major blood vessel in his temple during one of these staged accidents. She wanted nothing to do with it. Instead, she got a job as a cashier at a local casino. Unfortunately, not all was well with Angela. In 2013, during a low point, she swallowed a handful of Advil and tried to take her own life. After this, loving father Bill swooped in and moved her into a much nicer apartment. Don't worry, daddy will take care of you. Little did she know, accepting his help was the gateway to joining the family business, the one thing she'd vowed not to do. It wasn't long after Angela's recovery when she was cast in her first big role. She played the at-fault driver in a staged accident. She watched as her father got into her Sebring convertible and drove it straight towards a waiting Mercedes, with the actors playing the victims inside. Her car struck the Mercedes, sending it spinning. When it stopped, Bill got out and sped off to a waiting vehicle while Angela took his place at the wheel. When the police arrived, she asked about the victims in the other car, who were pretending to be only partially conscious. For this job, Bill paid Angela $10,000. Considering Bill had totaled her car, he then bought her a Cadillac CTS. Angela, for this, continued working with her father until things took a turn for the worse. You see, in 2015, Angela started dating a construction worker. She quickly married him, had a baby, and moved in together. This didn't stop Bill's machinations. A new house meant a new opportunity. There'd been no fraud there yet. The plan this time was to stage a nasty fall down the stairs. She stood near the bottom and looked up as her father stood there as he often did, with box cutter in hand and victim at arm's reach. He cut his friend Misael on the temple and shoved him down the stairs. It was Angela's job to call 911 and act like something terrible had happened, a task she pulled off with great ease considering Bill had again slashed a major vessel in his friend's temple and he was bleeding much more than anticipated. While the 911 dispatcher told Angela to press towels to the man's wound, her father told her to stop, to hold off. See, Bill wanted this man to be in really bad shape when the paramedics arrived, which meant letting him bleed out on the floor. Following this incredibly traumatic experience, Angela was much less inclined to be involved with her psychotic father's schemes. That was, of course, until circumstance arose. Her husband, a construction worker, suffered a knee injury and was unable to work, which also means he was unable to pay the steep American medical bills. Like clockwork, loving father Bill appeared, with another idea. How about you come play victim in another accident? Bill took her into his Escalade, measured where her head would likely hit the car's wall, and whacked that spot with a pint glass wrapped in sandpaper. She then poured a bottle of urine on herself and stuck to the plan for the paramedics and hospital. For this, Bill paid her $40,000. Bill knew exactly how to manipulate the people around him to commit crimes with him. It was relatively simple if you have the stomach for it, of course. Just take advantage of when they're at their lowest, and if you think they won't end up at their lowest, make sure they get there. If Bill could do this to his family, what do you think he'd be willing to do to someone else? Ron Wells was a well-known prominent real estate developer who'd spent the last 30 years restoring historic buildings in the Seattle area. He and Bill met through a mutual business partner and soon realized they shared a love of luxury cars. The pair quickly became thick, traveling around the country together, doing rich people things. Ron talked to Bill about his problems and Bill listened. Ron was going through a messy divorce and that means he owed lawyers a lot of money. See, Ron was rich on paper, but like many rich people, he didn't have liquid funds. Money sitting in a bank account 
is not a good use of money. Instead, all of his wealth was tied up in assets, predominantly real estate deals, and this was impossible to move. But it didn't matter, he had good friend Bill, who was cash rich, right? Ron asked Bill for a short term loan of $20,000 and Bill was more than happy to help. You can see where I'm going with this. The divorce kept dragging on, the lawyers needed more money, not only could Ron not pay back the loan, he needed more. Well what would you know? Bill just happened to know how Ron could make some cash real quick. This alternate arrangement involved Ron's Dodge Ram and Bill's speedboat. On the night of October 16th, 2016, Bill drove Ron's Ram 3500 truck straight into a Ford F-250, which was towing Bill's speedboat. Right after the impact, Bill and Ron switched places so it looked like Ron was the one at the at-fault vehicle, and for this, the insurance company paid out $338,266. Little did Ron know this one mistake, this one lapse in judgment, trusting Bill this one time would cost him literally everything. Now you think getting away with all these scams for all these years, Bill would look into seeking another means of income, one that was less risky. Perhaps take some of his ill-gotten gains and go legit, invest it all, live a wealthy man's life and stop beating his wife with household objects, stop hitting his daughter with a brick. But whether he enjoyed it too much or the money was simply too great, he just couldn't stop himself. He'd grown accustomed to what the money bought, an incredibly lavish lifestyle, a large mansion you'd see on MTV Cribs, you know the one with the circular driveway out front with a Bentley sitting there, a velvet lined movie theatre in the basement, and that isn't all. Bill needed to keep his pet chihuahua, whom he lovingly called Chica, in her custom made ball gowns that he dressed her in. He was a very eccentric man. When Chica died, he had a custom mausoleum built for her in the mansion's backyard to bury her, along with her favourite ball gowns and some jewels. Everything was going good for Bill. He was taking the majority of the money, he was doing real well for himself, and he made sure that everyone else, constantly needed new jobs to live their mediocre lives. That way, he had a constant and willing workforce that he could abuse for his own gain. Eventually, the inevitable happened. People wanted out. Ryan was the first domino to fall. The years of breaking the law, the lying, the being beaten, cut and bruised by his uncle, it all got to him. He was now drinking heavily and suffering from complex PTSD. He spent his evenings drunk, googling the safety ratings of the cars he was in when Uncle Bill slammed into them. He felt pains in his body and wondered if the radiation from the dozens of CT scans he was forced to take in order to prove his concussions for insurance payouts had caught up to him. And it was too much. Bill, however, didn't care. And lucky for him, Ryan was no good with money. He was in debt, big time. And the kicker is that he was in debt to Uncle Bill. Ryan was starting to refuse to participate in any more schemes, so Bill had to sweeten the deal. He did so by dangling the one thing he knew weighed most on Ryan. Do one more crash for me, and I'll take my name off the deed to your house. You'll be able to get a normal mortgage, and everything will be fine. Ryan agreed, but this time, Bill wanted him to get creative with the injuries. Bill told Ryan he needed to take a pair of pliers and chip his own tooth. 30 minutes and several shots of whiskey later, Ryan finally got the courage to do it. After the crash, he used a shard of glass to slit his own lip to make it look as convincing as possible, and waited until the paramedics were looking directly at him to spit the broken tooth into his hand. Ryan waited weeks and weeks for any kind of good news, to hear that the payment had come through and that he was free of Bill's grasp. Unfortunately, that day never came. Instead, Ryan found himself chasing Bill for an update and he explained that the crash didn't work, the insurance company wouldn't pay out, it was all for nothing. Ryan was obviously crushed, he was at the end of his rope. More so later when he found out that Bill lied, the payout was $282,000 and Bill kept it all. He never removed his name from Ryan's deed and, well, you're about to see what happened. It seems like the good times were going to last forever, but all good things must come to an end eventually. Bill and his crew were destined to run out of gas. Funnily enough, it was an entirely unrelated incident that started the collapse of Bill's empire. In November 2016, two of the men who'd been involved in the crashes were arrested in an unrelated drug trafficking bust. Bill spoke at the bail hearing for one of them, convincing the judge to appoint him custodian so he could make sure he appeared for the hearings. This incident, however, heightened Bill's paranoia. He started stockpiling guns, hoarding freeze-dried food, and to add to his worry, he heard a rumour that investigators had visited his notary in Vegas. He received notices for a couple of his banks that they were closing his accounts. In May of 2018, 
the FBI showed up at Bill's compound and Ryan's house with search warrants. The government seized more than $190,000 from his various bank accounts, $260,000 from an escrow account, and $42,000 in cash, along with his mansion and the house that he was supposed to sign over to Ryan and never did. The indictment came out in December of 2018. It named Bill, his wife, both his children, Ryan and his girlfriend Kimmy, Rich divorced Ron, along with nine others. They were accused of deliberately staging a series of automobile, boating, stairfall, pedestrian vehicle and other accidents in Washington, Idaho, Nevada and California from 2013 until 2018, which is all they could charge them with due to a five year statute of limitations Meaning, despite the fact he'd been doing this for considerably longer, the government couldn't charge him with anything prior to 2013. In January, Bill and his co-conspirators appeared at the federal courthouse. Bill pleaded not guilty to 87 counts. The court deemed him not a flight risk, allowing him to be released on an unsecured bond without location monitoring, and he promised to pay $750,000 if he didn't show up to court. You should know exactly where this is going now. In June of 2019, as Bill and the others waited for their sentencing, Bill visited Angela in Las Vegas. They had dinner together, and then at the end, he hugged his daughter and granddaughter goodbye. A few days later, Angela received a typed letter from her dad in the mail. It read as follows. Please understand, my options are all very bad. I know I do not want to die in jail, and it will serve no purpose for me to be there. I will not be able to help anyone, and would just be a burden to the few people in the world that even really care about me. This was Bill's goodbye. He was going on the run. A reward was offered for anyone who had information about his whereabouts, but to date, none have surfaced. Accused of staging car accidents, ripping off insurance companies, and running a major crime ring. Now authorities say William Mize has vanished. This evening, the U.S. Marshal asking for your help in finding him. There's a cash reward up for grabs. The I team's. Been a flyer circulated by the U.S. Marshal stating that Bill likes, quote, warm weather, marinas, and a lavish lifestyle. He was once spotted at a liquor store outside Las Vegas in 2019, but quickly left without buying anything. Since then, no leads. In the end, Bill left everyone else holding the bags. Ron Wells got one year of home detention, as did Bill's son Will. Angela got six months of prison. Ryan got 19 months, but told the court he was grateful he no longer had to be under Bill's control. And Bill's wife, Sandy, got the harshest term of all, nearly six years in prison though this could have been preferable to another six years of being beaten by her husband with pans, bottles and bricks. To this day, William Mize IV is missing, on the run from the US Marshals and the consequences of his actions.